Our next speaker, Justice Paul Newby, was a member of the North Carolina Courts Commission. He taught for North Carolina Judicial College, along with uh, other various continuing education courses. In 1985, he was appointed as the Assistant United States Attorney in Raleigh, where he served for 19 years. He was Vice President of the North Carolina Bar Association and a strong proponent for civic education. He currently serves on the Supreme Court, which began in 2004. Please help me welcome Justice Paul Newby. It was May of 1787. In Pennsylvania, there was a debate about the forming of a new nation's constitution. But in North Carolina, the question before the court was whether or not the judicial branch had the right to say uh, what the Constitution meant and could protect the Constitution. You see, the legislature had passed a law that deprived uh, people of jury trials under certain uh, circumstances. And yet, the Constitution of the state of North Carolina clearly said that citizens had a right to a jury trial. Reasoning for the court the justice said, if the legislature could do away with the right to a jury trial, could it not also do away with the right to election? Could the legislature not perpetuate itself through its own actions? Someone needed to protect the basic constitutional rights of the citizens. And the court reasoned that it would, uh, by a process of elimination, would be the court. That's the first case, reported case, of judicial review, which comes from the Supreme Court of North Carolina, 16 years before Marbury versus Madison. And yet the role of the judiciary would continue to be debated for uh, a period of time. You see, Hamilton in Federalist 78 said, the judicial branch has no will of its own. It simply decides cases. He, he argued that, as Montesquieu had said, that the judicial branch needs protection because it's next to nothing. On the other hand, Jefferson was very, very alarmed by the power that was given to the judicial branch. He said once the judicial branch realized the extent of the power that they had, that they would be tempted to exercise their own will and to supplant the will of the uh, elected officials with the will of the judge. It seems that for the first 150 years of our country, the Hamiltonian view prevailed. And yet, unfortunately, in the last 75 years, it seems that judges have realized the extent of their power and that they could, in fact, uh, impress upon our nation the values of individual judges, often not elected. Certainly, we have seen time and again these actions of the judiciary which seem to uh, seek to undermine the very foundations of our country. Washington clearly said that religion was indispensable for democracy to succeed. The preamble to our state constitution, written in 1868 by blacks and whites, uh, before they restructured the government of the state of North Carolina, made a bold statement, which I think captures the view of our fellow Americans. It says this, it says, we the people of the state of North Carolina, grateful to Almighty God, the sovereign ruler of nations, for the preservation of the American Union and the existence of our civil, political, and religious liberties, and acknowledging our dependence upon God for the continuation of those blessings to us and to our posterity. We are that posterity, and yet time and again we are shocked when we see these rulings of judges that seem to go at the heart of who we are as a nation. In 2003-2004, um, like you, I became very concerned about the direction uh, that some of these decisions were taking our country. And I was convicted that I had not been fulfilling the command of 1 Timothy 2 that says that we're to pray for those in authority over us, 
that we may live quiet and peaceful lives in all godliness and holiness. This pleases God our Savior who wants all to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. And so I began to pray more fervently for our country. You see, prayer had been a part of my life uh, since before I was born. Uh, I'm fortunate to have had uh, two very godly Christian parents. Uh, my mom and my dad. Uh, mom a school teacher, dad an hourly worker, uh, impressed upon me uh, some of my earliest remembrances to see them on their knees individually uh, in times of prayer, seeking God's blessings on our family uh, before we would have our own family quiet time. Um, I was told that uh, generations before had prayed for my generation, a generation yet unborn, that God would um, have through the work of his spirit uh, would produce a future godly generations. So uh, prayer was something that I should have been practicing with regard to the leadership of our nation uh, much more uh, faithfully. Through prayer, uh, my parents had taught me, and through prayer, uh, I committed my life to Jesus Christ. Through prayer, um, God brought me a godly Christian wife, Macon, who's with me today. Through prayer, God blessed us with four children. Through prayer, God had directed uh, my path uh, in my career. Time and again, I have seen God answer prayer faithfully. So in 2004, as I prayed uh, about our nation, uh, I sensed God urging that I should be willing to be involved. Uh, it was one of those moments of, here I am, God, send somebody else. God, you, 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 you've, you've got this wrong. Look, God, let me explain some things to you, okay? Uh, first off, in North Carolina, we elect our judges. It's a nonpartisan race, no R's and D's. Uh, we have to run by name. Uh, God, my name is Paul Newby. Now, now, the Newbies have been in North Carolina since 1700, but none of them ever did anything. It's not like the name Newby uh, casts fear through the hearts of politicians across our state. And God's Scooby Dooby vote for newbie only gets you so many votes. <laughs> but God persisted that this would be something that we should be willing to do. And through my prayer, through the, the prayers of my precious wife, Macon, uh, God did uh, lay on our hearts to continue. We did run for the North Carolina Supreme Court. And by God's grace, uh, I was elected in 2004. And by God's grace, I have continued to see his answer to prayer as I have uh, prayed for the cases that come before our court, um, as I have seen time and again uh, the uh, way that God is faithful in always answering the prayers uh, that we lift to him. Um, people say, well, Justice Newby, how should we pray for you? Well, first off, pray that I get it right. Uh, I need to do justice in each of the cases that come before me but then that I will have influence uh, as I dialogue with my colleagues, as I write my opinions, uh, that God would grant me favor uh, among the other justices as well as the practitioners of the bar, the law professors, the legal establishment in North Carolina. Uh, God has faithfully done that, and I would ask that you continue to pray. But then as you pray for judges across our nation, first off, I would ask that you uh, pray consistent with Exodus 18, uh, verse 21, where Moses' father-in-law came to him and described the kind of leadership Moses needed to look for. He said, capable people, you needed trustworthy people, and you needed people who fear God. Capable, by education, training, and experience, they're qualified for the position. Trustworthy, that they are honest, that they will fairly and impartially apply the law not be subject to improper influences like the applaud of the liberal establishment or other groups that would seek to influence improperly our judicial determinations. It's interesting that Lady Justice is blind and she uh, symbolically, the idea is that anyone who comes before the court will be treated equally and fairly. The richest of the rich, the poorest of the poor, the most powerful, the least powerful, Lady Justice has a blindfold and cannot see uh, those before her. Uh, I had a fifth grader come up to me and say, Justice Newby, what's it like to have a job where you wear a blindfold all day long? 
And while I loved his literalism, uh, this, the uh, idea is exactly correct. Uh, the courts are not to see. Uh, the courts are not to impose their own will. The courts are simply to decide the cases that come before it. The fear of the Lord is the thing that allows us to have the rule of law and allows us to have a legal system that is not swayed by political tides, but is in fact simply deciding the cases before it. You see, to encourage the judges of his time, Jehoshaphat said this, carefully consider what you do because you are not judging for man, but for the Lord who is with you whenever you give a verdict. Now let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Judge carefully for with the Lord our God, there is no injustice or partiality or bribery. You see, I pray much as um, Chief Justice Roberts discussed that our judiciary would be noted by its judicial modesty, by humility, by judicial self-restraint. I pray that our judges would humbly seek God's wisdom. James 1.5 says if any of us lack wisdom, we should ask and God will freely give that. And yet it is that act of humility of asking that I pray that our judges would characterize. For Proverbs 2 reminds us that if we will seek God's wisdom, then we will understand what is right and just and fair, every good path. For wisdom will enter our hearts, knowledge will be pleasant to our soul, discretion will protect us, and understanding will guard us. I ask you to pray fervently for the judges in our country. It is so true that they, in an extraordinary way, influence and shape our culture and society. Pray that the, each, each judge would recognize his or her own uh, limitations, would humbly seek God's wisdom, Perhaps again, we may be a nation where we can confidently say that our God is the Lord.